begin with prayer. Father, the psalmist has written, I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. Help us, O Lord, that we might say with the psalmist, with my whole heart, I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. Be with Dave Herod as he leads worship, Steve Rodans as he intercedes for the church, and our pastor as he encourages us to wonder, to treasure, and to ponder the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray in his name. Amen. Morning, everyone. I was beginning to think I was never going to get up here. <laughs> Will you please stand for the call to worship? This morning, our call to worship is from Psalm 30, verse 4. Sing praises to the Lord, O you his saints, and give thanks to his holy name. Let's remain standing and sing our opening hymn, number 219, O Worship the King. seated. <clears throat> Let's go to the Lord with our prayer of adoration. Heavenly Father, blessed Son, eternal Spirit, we adore you as one being, one essence, one God in three distinct persons for bringing sinners to your kingdom. Father, you have loved us and sent Jesus to redeem us. Jesus, you have loved us and assumed our nature, shed your blood to wash away our sins, 
and given us your righteousness to cover our unworthiness. Holy Spirit, you have loved us and entered our hearts, implanted their eternal life, revealed to us the glories of Jesus. Three persons in one God, we bless and praise you for love, so unmerited, so unspeakable, so wondrous, so mighty to save the lost and to raise them to glory. Father, we thank you that in the fullness of your grace, you have given us to Jesus. Jesus, we thank you that in the fullness of your grace, you have accepted us. Holy Spirit, we thank you that in the fullness of your grace, you have shown us Jesus as our salvation, implanted faith within us, subdued our stubborn hearts, and made us one with him forever. Father, you are enthroned to hear our prayers. Jesus, your hand is outstretched to take our petitions and present them on our behalf to the Father. Holy Spirit, you are willing to help our infirmities, to show us our need, to supply words, to pray within us, and to strengthen us when we are weak. Triune God, you who command the universe, have commanded us to ask for those things that concern your kingdom and our souls. Let each of us live and pray as one baptized into the threefold name of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Now will you please stand and let's say together the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. This morning we're going to consider the sixth question from the Westminster Shorter Catechism. And as is our practice now, I'll read the question and then we can read together the answer. Question six, how many persons are there in the Godhead? There are three persons in the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one God, the same in substance, equal in power and glory. Now, Christianity is a fact-based religion, and this description of God or the Godhead in answer to question six as three persons is no different. I think I made a mistake the last time when I talked about the first question because I tried to comment on all the proof texts, which um, I think created more confusion than, than illumination. But this time I want to use the first proof text for this question because in it we see the reality of the three persons of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and the way their relationship causes them to interact. And this first proof text is a description from Matthew's Gospel of Jesus' baptism. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were open to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. So first we see the son coming up from the water and the first thing he sees are the heavens opened up to him. I don't think it's an overstatement to say that sin largely shuts up heaven to us and puts a stop to what should be friendly interaction between God and man. But now we have the son of God opening the heavens again to all believers. And I also, getting back to the relationship between God the Father and God the Son, I can't help but think that what Jesus saw 
was intended as an encouragement to him in the beginning of his ministry and assurance of the welcome home he would receive when that ministry was over. So then everyone saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and resting on Jesus because this was the public inauguration of his ministry. If you remember, we read in Genesis that at the beginning of the old world, the spirit of God hovered over the waters. So now in the beginning of this new world, and exactly as Isaiah foretold, the spirit of the Lord rested on Jesus because he was to be a prophet speaking by the spirit of God. And then finally, to explain and complete this picture, there came a voice from heaven. God, the Holy Spirit, manifested himself as a dove. God, the Father, by a voice. And we've seen this kind of thing before. When the law was given on Mount Horeb, there was a fire that frightened everyone. But all they heard was a voice. And this gospel message is given the same way. I would suggest that these words spoken by the Father are the best news that ever came from heaven to earth, for they speak plainly and fully of God's love for his Christ and the reason for that favor. He's God's beloved son, his dear son, and most important, he is the son of God's love because Jesus consented to undertake the work of our salvation. And he explains this in John's gospel. For this reason, the father loves me because I lay down my life and I may take it, that I may take it up again. If you think about it, without Jesus in the three persons of the Godhead, God can be the consuming fire that we sinners deserve. With Jesus, God is a reconciled father. This is really the sum of the whole gospel that God has declared by a voice from heaven that Jesus Christ is his beloved son in whom he is well pleased. And by faith, we can agree and say that he is our beloved savior in whom we are well pleased. So after identifying the three persons of the Godhead, the answer goes on to give us more important information. All persons of the Godhead are one God of the same substance and equal in power and glory. Now the Westminster Confession of Faith on this same subjects, subject explains how this could be so in telling us that the Son is eternally begotten of the Father and the Holy Ghost is eternally proceeding from the Father and the Son. Now, I don't know about you, I don't use the word begotten very often, in fact, never. Um, so it's not something we think of so much in modern, in modern English. I think a good way to understand it is to contrast begetting with creating. To beget is to become the father of someone. To create means to make some thing. When you beget, you beget something of the same kind as yourself. When you create, you make something of a different kind from yourself. You might think of a sculptor. They can make a, a wonderful image of a human being, but it's not a human. So God, Jesus is begotten of God while we are created by him. And equally important in trying to understand the relationship between the three persons of the Godhead is that the relation ship of the father and the son is a relationship of mutual and eternal love. Now we tend to understand and think about love as something one person feels for another, but because of the reality of the Godhead as being three persons in one being, uh, God is a relational being in and of himself in ways that we just simply aren't. And for that reason, God can say, uh, God, John can say God is love and mean that the very essence and nature of God is love. The mutual and eternal love between the Father and the Son is such a live and concrete thing that the union itself is also a person of the Godhead. We may think that we don't know the Holy Ghost that well intellectually in the sense of trying to form a mental image about him, but we certainly know him very well experientially. I thought I was going to stumble over that word, but I I actually said it right. Because he is proceeding, as the confession of faith tells us, he's always coming to us from the Father and from the Son. Now, one of the most important aspects of faith is knowledge. We can't have faith in something that we don't know anything about. 
And in a sense, this understanding of the three-person God is in some ways the very beginning of theology, the knowledge we gain from the study of God. This theology started with people's general understanding of God, supplemented by the written experience of his chosen people, the Jews. Then exactly as the Jewish scriptures predicted, there came a man who announced himself as God's son. They heard him teach, they heard him preach, they saw him perform miracles, but most amazing of all, they encountered him alive and well within days after they knew for a certainty that he had been killed on a Roman cross. So after he returned to his home in heaven, his followers formed a little society or a community and found God somehow inside him. And here's another amazing thing, directing them and empowering them. I'll just use the words of the Jewish leaders at the time because it was true then and it's true now. These men turned the world upside down. And when they worked all this out, they came to know the three person God. So now we've been introduced to the fact that God we worship is made up of three persons and we have a better, I hope, understanding of what this means, but why is it so important? This concept is of critical importance because of something we're going to study in more detail in a couple months, I would think, in question 34, and that's the concept of adoption. And as I say this, um, maybe we call this the too good to be true news, it's so amazing. Through God's act of free grace determined upon our faith in Jesus, the believer becomes a child of God. The whole promise of Christianity is that we can, if we let God have his way, come to share in the life of Christ. If we do, now remember what I said about begotten and creating. If we do, we the created beings will be sharing a begotten life which has always existed and always will exist. Christ is the son of God. If we share in this life, we will be children of God, loving and being loved by the Father, and the Holy Ghost will rise in us for our sanctification. So why wouldn't we want to be a part of a life like that? Um, I often joke when something obvious, or at least something I think is obvious, uh, other people see, I say, isn't it wonderful when common sense suddenly breaks out? And this is surely common sense. If we want to be warm, we stand near the fire. If we want to be wet, we jump in the water. If we want to have unimaginable joy and power and peace for eternity, we have to get into the thing that has that. And the thing that has that is the three-person God of Christianity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. We're being offered a life that Jesus has lived for eternity, a life the Father's love has made available to us through Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, and the transforming power of the Holy Spirit. But as always, sin stands in the way. So let's recognize that reality, repent, and seek God's forgiveness, first silently, and then by reading the corporate confession of sin in our bulletins. And now let's, let's pray together. Our great and everlasting God, whose eternal power and divine nature have been seen through the things you have made, we acknowledge that we are without excuse. For although we have known you, we have not honored you as God, nor given you thanks. But we have become futile in our thinking, and our senseless minds have been darkened. Claiming to be wise, we have become fools. We have been filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, covetousness, and malice, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and craftiness. We are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, rebellious toward parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Yet we do also heartily acknowledge 
that when we were weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. We most joyfully confess that you have proven your love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Forgive our sins, we pray, through him who was handed over to death for our trespasses and was raised for our justification. Amen. Now hear this declaration of pardon from Psalm 32, verse 1. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Amen. Let's all pray together. Father God, as the days grow longer and our part of the world warms up, we give you thanks for the beauty of your creation. Oh Lord, how, how manifold are your works. In wisdom, you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Here is the sea, great and wide, which teems with creatures innumerable, living things both small and great. Thank you for the astounding variety of animal and plant life you have covered the earth. Everything you made is very good. We thank you for our building and grounds and for the opportunity to maintain it. As we work together to maintain our outpost this Saturday, we ask that you bless our time together as we work side by side. We pray for good fellowship and good conversation. As we contend with the thorn and thistles, you remind us that we need to tend to our own gardens. Lord, help us maximize, maximize our time with you, our master gardener, to learn from you and grow in your word and wisdom. Help us weed out anything in our lives that should not be there. Help us identify the weeds. And when you prune us, let us accept it gladly and with confidence, knowing it is for our good and your, your glory to be more fruitful. We pray that the beauty and handiwork of your creation, especially this time of year where trees are in flower and on full display, that that will awaken people to notice and contemplate the creator. We pray your creation opens minds and hearts to point to our Lord and Savior Jesus and the need for salvation. We pray you will use us, your church, to do the pointing to Jesus and his gospel. We give you thanks for new life as Elias Christopher Marley was born this week. Bless Elias and parents, Henry and Alyssa. We thank you for the baptism of Clark Randall today that the sign of the covenant will be placed on him, making him part of the visible church. We ask for your blessing on Clark and family and pray he will grow in the admonition of the Lord throughout his years. Today, we think of Sharon Souza who lost her mom. Pray that she'd be with her as she's grieving. Just show her the peace and comfort that you do. We pray for Ann Dalton's daughter, Amanda, who has a serious foot injury. We ask for relief of pain and healing during her downtime and pray she will be mobile again in short order. We ask for travel mercies for Michelle DeFonte. Keep her safe and healthy during her travels. This week we pray. And we pray for Stephen and Nicole Horn's friends, Dave and Susan and their daughter, Olivia, who has cancer. We pray you'll remove her cancer, Lord. Protect Olivia's body from her chemotherapy treatments. We pray this family rest in you while navigating through their trials. We pray for Gabriella, that you remove the cause of her symptoms during her pregnancy. Help the medical staff figure out the root cause of her issue. Calm Gabriella and heal her, we pray, Lord, and be with PJ as, as he cares for her. We also lift up baby Jackie, that you keep your protective hand on him as he develops. He has some very serious issues, but we know your arm is not short. Bless and keep Jackie, Lord, and bring Jackie to a safe delivery in your timing. Lord, continue to bless and affect the lives of those both leading and attending Grief Share. Several participants experienced devastating challenges this past week on top of grieving for loved ones. We pray you will turn these challenges into opportunities to grow closer to you. Be with those who are hurting, Lord, and give comfort as only you can. And use the group to share in each other's burdens. We pray for Gopal and Sheila and their ministry in Nepal and India. We echo their prayers and ask that you guide them in their desires of church expansion and care for children in the Mumbai re region. We lift up the new creation school in Nepal and thank you for the increased enrollments. We pray the school will be a benefit to both students and teachers. 
We also lift up the health issues of Gopal and Sheila and ask that you restore their health. We ask that you provide them with the resources needed to be restored to good health. Be with Sheila as she is scheduled for surgery this week. We pray that they cast their cares upon you and rest in you and your good timing. We pray for the families of those who were killed in the mall shooting in Allen, Texas. As answers are sought in this senseless tragedy, we pray many will turn to you. We pray for a revival that your spirit will go out and turn many hearts and minds to you and your ways, that you will turn this evil into good. We pray for those holding public office at all levels of government. We pray you will keep them from evil, that you will surround them with your hedge of protection, and they will be lovers of righteousness and justice and not lovers of power and money. Give them much wisdom and give them hearts of servants. We pray you give them strength to keep from caving into the pressures of external forces. Grant them courage to do what is right and protect them and their families from all dangers. Forgive us, Lord, our nation has lost its way without you. We are broken, we don't fear you. We pray repentance for our entire nation, especially from us, your body of believers in this nation. Give your people boldness to stand up for truth and justice and righteousness. Your word states that if we seek your face and turn from our evil ways, you will hear from heaven and heal our land. And we pray for this healing, Lord. Use your saints. May your gospel go forth from your saints to bring others into your kingdom. Help us not let our love grow cold and neglect this sacred duty. Father, we do not live by bread alone. Let the heavenly food of scripture we are about to hear nourish us in the ways of eternal life through Jesus Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen. So our first reading is a famous chapter, Proverbs 31, and the, the second half of the chapter is the one that we most normally think of when we think of Proverbs 31, uh, which is about the excellent wife, you know, who can find. But the first few verses are very interesting, and it's a, a, about a son who seems to have lost his way, and he's destined for an important position, and his mother has to give him a talking to, all right? And that's the first nine verses, then followed immediately by the one we're more familiar with. The words of King Lemuel, an oracle that his mother taught him, what are you doing, my son? What are you doing, son of my womb? What are you doing, son of my vows? Do not give your strength to women, your ways to those who destroy kings. It is not for kings, O Lemuel, it's not for kings to drink wine or for rulers to take strong drink, lest they drink and forget what has been decreed and pervert the rights of all the afflicted. Give strong drink to the one who is perishing and wine to those in bitter distress. Let them drink and forget their poverty and remember their misery no more. Open your mouth for the mute for the rights of all who are destitute. Open your mouth, judge righteously, defend the rights of the poor and needy. Isn't that great? It really fits in with our visitors today too, I think. An excellent wife who can find. She is far more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. She seeks wool and flax and works with willing hands. She's like the ships of the merchant. She brings her food from afar. She rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household and portions for her maidens. She considers a field and buys it. With the fruit of her hands, she plants a vineyard. She dresses herself with strength and makes her arms strong. She perceives that her merchandise is profitable. Her lamp does not go out at night. She puts her hands to the distaff and her hands hold the spindle. She opens her hand to the poor and reaches out her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of snow for her household, for all her household are clothed in scarlet. She makes bed coverings for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them. She delivers sashes to the merchant. Strength and dignity are her clothing, and she laughs 
at the time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her works praise her in the gates. And my, my first thought as I'm reading that second half is just, I'm just so thankful for all the women of this congregation. Honestly, that's, that's what my first thought. But then one of the women in the congregation today, when, when we were talking about this past, she said, no, but it all, often makes people feel very, very guilty. All right, thinking, well, I'm not that. But here's the thing I want you to think about before we go on to Haggai. I want you to think about this from a gospel standpoint. Who is the great husband? And who will be the great bride, right? Isn't Jesus the perfect husband? And is it not your destiny, church, to be the perfected bride of Christ? So if there's anything good that you see in here, can you imagine this? That by grace, this is your destiny and mine too, together, that we would be the bride of Christ. Does that help? A little bit. Okay. Haggai, now we go on, chapter 2, 10 through 19. So we've been going through this, this uh, little book and looking at this struggle of building a temple and the, the different expectations that people had. I mean, trying to make the connection to the idea of the perfect temple that is coming, that there's a temple of the Holy Spirit. And again, just as you are the bride of Christ here again, there's encouragement for you. You are living stones in the temple of the Holy Spirit. And again, our destiny is to be a great dwelling place for the Lord. So here we go, <clears throat> going back now to this experience, Haggai, 2, 10 through 19, as the people of God coming back from exile had this uh, important job to rebuild the temple, which they ignored. But then look at the difference once they actually would set their hearts to the work that was in front of them. So it says this, on the 24th day of the ninth month in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came by Haggai, the prophet. Thus says the Lord of hosts, ask the priests about the law. If someone carries holy meat in the fold of the garment of his garment and touches with his fold bread or stew or wine or oil or any kind of food, does it become holy? The priest answered and said, no. Then Haggai said, if someone who is unclean by contact with a dead body touches any of these, does it become unclean? The priest answered and said, it does become unclean. Then Haggai answered and said, so is it with this people and with this nation before me, declares the Lord, and so with every work of their hands. And what they offer there is unclean. Now then, consider from this day onward, before stone was placed upon stone in the temple of the Lord, how did you fare? When one came to a heap of 20 measures, there were but 10. When one came to the wine vat to draw 50 measures, there were but 20. I struck you and all the products of your toil with blight and with mildew and with hail, yet you did not turn to me, declares the Lord. Consider from this day onward, from the 24th day of the ninth month, since the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider, is the seed yet in the barn Indeed, the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, and the olive tree have yielded nothing. But from this day on, I will bless you. So there's that future right there for people that would be in the temple of the Lord and part of the temple of the Lord. And that blessing is so great. It's beyond what any eye has seen or ear heard. So now we come to the one who is at the very center of this blessing as we're looking at the birth of Christ from Luke 2, we stand, we're looking at Luke 2, 15 through 20. We've, we've been looking for the last couple of passages at the actual birth and the statement that was made by the angel of the Lord uh, to the shepherds, but now it's time to go and prove the point. Go and prove the point, go and see, see the sign. 
that was mentioned. So here we have it, Luke 2, 15 through 20. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. Remember that, it's a feeding trough, okay? Think about that, lying in a feeding trough. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. Please be seated. So what do we do with, with good news? What do we do with good news? You know, we... We get some good news and, you know, the, whether we do anything with it requires, first of all, that we answer the question, do I believe this good news? If I don't believe this good news, then I just ignore it, I guess, and I go about my business. Maybe out of curiosity, I'll go check something out. But it's the heart of faith that we're granted by God that would en enable us to actually respond rightly to good news. And so here what we have is some good news that was actually preached to shepherds, a very unlikely group of people to receive this good news. And the unlikely ambassador was an angel of the Lord that came. And the actual word of preaching good news is used in what was said. So we can go back and say, well, what was that good news at the time we looked at this verse? He said it was really outstanding news. Remember, good news of great joy that will be for all the people. And then here's the translation, for unto you is born this day in the city of David, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. So that verse, that verse 11 in this chapter, absolutely loaded with good news that this is not only the birth of a child, which of course, it, it, that's wonderful news to have a child born. But this is so much more than that, because who is this child? This is the descendant of David. They're in the city of David, but an expected descendant of David would come, who would be what? A savior, a savior who could save us, not just from the trials that we face in this fallen world, the kind of prayer requests that we might very rightly cast our cares before the Lord, but the, the biggest trouble we could ever have with the justice of a holy almighty God that was coming against us. And who can save us from such a big trouble as that? But this boy now has been born who would be, yes, the son of David, but savior. This word then that was used was Christ or the Hebrew was Messiah. So this Messiah, this anointed one, this Christ, is also, I wonder if they got this part, the Lord. So the very I am that Dave is talking about, really, when thinking about the Trinity, there's only one God existing eternally in, in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So this, this Lord now has become man. In order to do what? Well, to do the rest of the stuff we're talking about is good news. To be the Savior who would stand in our place. To be the anointed one, even to be the Lord himself, fully God, fully man. And now we can have this confident expectation that the biggest problem that we could ever have had the justice of God coming against us. This problem has been dealt with handily by this one. And now we know that, you know, it's not just a baby in the manger. It's, it's the whole ministry, the miracle working power, the teaching of this man. It's his death on the cross and his resurrection from the dead, his ascension, his pouring out the spirit upon the church. We have to say, now we, with 2,000 years behind us too, we have to say this is the one. If not him, then who? Who could possibly 
have met all the requirements necessary in order to be this important son of David. Is this good news? You bet. This is very good news for us, for people, it turns out from every tribe and tongue and nation, for all who would come to Christ, whatever their situation may be, however difficult they may have in their, uh, whatever difficulty they may have in their life in this world, now we have the assurance of eternity this is marvelous. And this is, this is the only thing that actually can settle our souls sometimes. Isn't that true? It, it, it's just too hard. There are too many disappointments. You know, overwhelming. We put in that prayer request about our grief share group and the challenges there. Yeah, they're, they're dealing with the loss of loved ones. But now what about all these other things that are happening? How could this be? All right. What about those who are trying to buy homes and they can't seem to buy a home any place? What about those that are just struggling to deal with substances in their lives and they're trying to figure out how to how do I get out of my uh, my bad situation with this substance. What about those that are every, having relational difficulties? And we think, I know I'm eternally saved. God, but what's all this stuff happening to me now? And when we come back to this and we see how big this is, we know that our present troubles are not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed. But we still weep with those who weep. We come alongside others, we help others in situations, and yet part of what we're bringing them is this good news that there's something bigger than your worst day, right? There's something better than your sleepless night, and somehow there's life forever in the presence of Almighty God. And what that is, well, that's, that's with the true and living God, the true God, the living God, and you in his presence. And then as Dave said, adopted into the household of God. <laughs> You're kidding me. Sons of God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, we have to come back to that or otherwise it's just overwhelming. Overwhelming to face the various challenges that we face. So what do we see here? We see these shepherds. Well, they, they apparently believed the good news that was given to them and they acted upon it. So what, what they did, first of all, I think it's very interesting. They strengthened one another in a good resolve that they're speaking to one another. This is not just, um, you know, a marathon where there's one runner and we're, we're just kind of looking at the time of that runner. We want to, he wants to beat his best time. It's not that kind of sport. This is a team. And so here we are and we're looking at these shepherds, these pastoral types, right? And they say, let us go over to Bethlehem. Ab absolutely, we should, shouldn't we? They said there was a sign that we would go and let, let's do it. And so they did. And they went with haste. They didn't sit around and say, you know, it's kind of late already. Plus, who's going to watch all these sheep? You know, they said, let's go. Bring the sheep. I don't care. Bring them into town. I don't know what they did with the sheep. Apparently, that's not the main point of the text. They went. They went with haste. And what they do? Well, well, they found Mary, Joseph, and the baby. They found the baby. What baby? This one, who's Christ the Lord. This is the promised one. This is everything that the Old Testament was preparing us for, was this one. And they saw what had been told them by the angel. But even more, what had been told them. They say by the Lord. It's interesting because the angel told them. It's an angel of the Lord. But here it says what had been told them by the Lord. So they recognized that what the angel said actually came from the Lord. Now that's interesting because it came from the Lord and this one was born is Christ the Lord. Go figure that out. Came from the angel of the Lord. But here's this baby, it's Christ the Lord. That's almost as hard as Psalm 110. The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right feet until I make your enemies a footstool. Wait, two, two lords talking to each other. This is like the baptism. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. You know, so we have the Lord now, and they have heard from the Lord by hearing through the angel. They acted upon it, and then they did something else. I honestly think they couldn't help themselves. They couldn't help themselves. They made known the saying that had been told them concerning the child. Now, I don't think they said, well, yeah, just here's what we want to tell you, that there would be a baby 
and the baby would have swaddling cloths on and he'd be lying in a feeding trough. We came and we found that baby. Isn't that amazing? No, it's not that amazing. I mean, it is amazing the baby's in a feeding trough. Yeah, it was a baby. That's great. But it's who the baby is. That had been told to them. So what they made known to the other people is said, this is what the message was. Unto you is born this day in the city of David, a savior who is Christ the Lord. And it would have been unfaithful. You know, they would have been unfaithful shepherds if they didn't pass on that message to the sheep. You get the idea here? See, they're shepherds of sheep, but, you know, they're like pastors of people. So they come and they have a very simple message. Don't say too much. Don't start out with three jokes, you know. Don't go on with a whole story about yourself. Just here's the message. You could just say this little thing here, you know, because it you don't have to dress it up really fine. Unto you is born this day in the city of David, a savior who is Christ the Lord, full stop. And then the rest is told by the expression on your face as to whether you actually believe it and what difference that would make in your life, all right? So then that's the first part, the shepherds said, all who heard it, verse 18, uh, I love the reactions that we're getting here. It's those who heard wondered at what the shepherds told them. I think that's a good response. Because sometimes we put this hand up in our hearts, you know? I'm not going to think about this at all. No, but instead, wonder about it. Think about it. What kind of things do you wonder about? Could it be that there actually is hope for anybody? Is there hope beyond life? I know death is real. Is life beyond death real? Is that possible? If so, how would it work? And wouldn't that have something to do with God? And who is God? And what does God require of man? personal, perfect, perpetual obedience to his law. How are we ever going to do that? But then the scriptures have said all kinds of things about good, good things that are coming and apparently connected to a person. Could this baby actually be the person through whom all this? See, this is wondering. It's asking questions of your own soul and maybe to others as well so that you're wondering together, it's a good thing to do. Think it through, think it through. And what you'll see is, look, there's only one God and he exists eternally in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And no other religious perspective is somehow going to work what this one fully God, fully man baby here is going to be able to do, no one else. So this is not just some religious idea or philosophy of life or self-help movement where you say, this all is going to be good for you if you just follow these 10 steps. It's not like that at all. It's like, look at this one. He's the promised one. And you just watch and see what happens here. Now, Mary is the next thing we look at here, verse 19. And she had been told some amazing things already. And, and now we hear this wonderful thing. She treasured up all these things. What, what does that mean? Well, it's the message, but it's the experience. These shepherds walked in. Who invited them? Place is already crowded. Remember, we said this is a normal Palestinian kind of home. They have the upstairs. It's all full. Why? Because all these people came in with the census. So there was no space in the normal living area in that building. So they had to go downstairs to the lower level where there's animals and a bunch of other people here. Apparently, those people... They might have thought, gee, it's too bad we didn't get to go upstairs, you know? But now it's worked out all right for them, I think, don't you? They've been there in the place where things are actually happening. You know, we don't hear about whatever they did upstairs anymore. That didn't come down to us through all the centuries. But here, what, what we have is the, that the, there are people who heard it. They wondered about these things the shepherd had said. I'd rather be in that spot downstairs. And then there's the mother, and she's treasuring up all these things, the whole, look, the words, the experience of it all, and she pondered them in her heart. Why? Because she didn't entirely understand it, couldn't entirely put it all together. It was too deep, too wonderful for her, for her as it would be for anyone. But she said, I'm going to treasure it, and I'm going to think about it and consider it. And at times along the way in her life, she might seem to, 
not really be clear about what's happening. You know, as Jesus's public ministry comes some 30 years later, it's going to be very tough for Mary. Look, she's going to need every, every treasure that she kept in her heart, anything she pondered to be able to reflect back on that. And then finally, at the end, I take my, my favorite part in a way. It seems maybe not like much. Verse 20, we're back to the shepherds. what they do? Well, they return to their fields and their sheep. But something's different, isn't it? So in other words, they go back to their normal life, which I believe is where most everything happens. As we respond to good news, the, where it actually happens is when you go back to your fields and your sheep. But the question is, will you do what these guys did? Glorifying and praising God for all they had he heard and seen as it had been told them. So we... We take things in through the word. You know, some shepherd comes along, he tries to feed us something good for our souls. We take it in, we experience something. The spirit of God is using it. There are the people of God. And they're, they're singing together. They're hearing things together and we're taking it into our souls. Then go back to your fields, go back to your sheep, okay? And now worship and praise God as you go. And think about what you've heard and ponder it, consider it, and and treasure it, and then, well, then do the next thing, right? Do the next thing that you have in your normal life to do. So what is the best news that can come our way? It, it's not that, okay, the, these buyers accepted the offer for that we put on the house. That's good. I hope it happens, you know. Or that this person is healed of cancer. Absolutely. Boy, I really do hope that that's the case or that this relationship is healed. or Look, those are really fantastic things. Just like every miracle of Jesus was fantastic news. If you had eyes to see and ears to hear, not everybody did though. Some people just said, why'd you do it on this day? This is the wrong day to do this great thing. So all those things being great news, you have eyes to see, you say, this is great, but what's the best news that can come our way? Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And look, if you want even better than that, here it is. He is risen. He accomplished what he set out to do. And this is, this is an absolute certainty for us. So the good news of the angel was confirmed by the shepherds. And such good news as they received demands the careful consideration of all who hear it. So really one application just split into three parts. Here it is, number one, we live in a busy world with a lot of noise and lots of distraction and this hasn't entirely helped, <laughs> all right? It has helped. There are things, I'm not, look, I'm not giving mine up, okay? All right, but the thing is, there's lots of noise, lots of distraction. It's just like in business, you know, back in the 80s when spreadsheets start to take off. You know what we were doing before we had spreadsheets? We were doing spreadsheets by hand. Imagine that. We had little things on pieces of paper and we'd go and you work it through and if you made an error somewhere along the way, it affected a whole bunch of other things. Have to make a whole new sheet out of that. And everybody thought, well, once you have these, you know, something like Excel, when that first really came out, you thought, we have really, we have entered the millennium. Here we are. We have this, and we're, we're going to have all this information. And you know what we started to do? We started to have more and more pieces of paper printed out. <laughs> more information than any person could actually seem to deal with. And we had the crisis of trying to say, look, in the midst of all these numbers, is there anything in here that you actually want to tell me? See, we thought everything was going to be great because we had this great tool, right? But what it ended up being was a busy world with a lot of noise and a lot of distraction. And you can think about almost every, wor uh, every kind of field that we work in right now, if, if it feels that way. All right. So don't miss your opportunity to actually stop, to wonder, to treasure, to ponder the good news of Jesus. And a lot of people feel like, look, you better do that first thing in the morning. If you do not do that first thing in the morning, you're probably going to do something else. And it's going to be really hard 
to get back at it again. But whatever, however it is that you do it, take some time to wonder, to treasure, to ponder the good news of Jesus. Why? Because you need it. You need it so much. Because Genesis 3 is still real. There was a fall, and it's affected everything. Sin and death have come into the world, and, and misery of all kinds have come into the world. And you need, in this battleground of the mind, you need victory that can only come from Jesus and the gospel. So take that in and do what you must to ponder it and consider it. And, and then do what these guys did, these pastors, these shepherds, right? Worship and serve our triune God. Okay, so I want to close with this verse. It's uh, Mark 4, verse 26, because the amazing thing as we're living our normal lives in, in this world, when we're just paying attention to the flocks and so forth, you know, that, that somehow the kingdom comes in the midst of all of that. The kingdom of God, this is Mark 4, 26, is as, a, as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. He sleeps and rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. That's the kingdom of God working. So if you think, well, look, my life can only be important if I end up going to some important places, some other life, if, if, we're, if I had a different family, a different situation, different job, then my life would actually matter. No, no. It's with your sheep, your fields, right now, live that life. Because like it says in, in, in Proverbs, like, like a, a bird that strays from his nest is a man who strays from his home. So when you have it in your mind, you say, oh, my life, my life doesn't count at all. And then you're looking around for another life that counts and you will no, that's like a bird that gets lost. You have a nest, you have a life that you've been given. Live it to the glory of God because of Jesus and what he's done for you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for what these shepherds did by your grace actually went. They saw, actually saw confirmed the sign that was there and they came back and, and they, they told others, but they came back and they glorified you. They praised you, Lord. So help us to be those that are just full of praise for you, for all that you've done in Jesus name. Amen. All right, well, let's stand again now. Beautiful hymn 429, come thou fount of every blessing. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious song, and sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount I fixed upon it, mount of God's unchanging love. Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I'm come, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from danger, interposed his precious blood. Oh, to raise how great a debtor I'm constrained to be. Let that grace now, like a feather, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, oh, that feel it, prone to
to leave a God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Yeah, that's, that's like that bird, right? Prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. Uh, take my heart and seal it. Here, we seal it too as we confess our faith together. May God seal these truths in our hearts. The Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. I want to invite the Randalls up now, if you will, come up. We have this uh, wonderful opportunity now of marking Clark Emrys Randall. Well, we got to break away. Okay. Okay. It's all over. Come on up this way. Here you go. We have Aurelia, Lucia. We have, uh, uh, we have Max and Steph. And, and now Clark is here. He's, he's, he's sleeping a little bit, not for long. Uh, <laughs> So anyway, I, I want to just uh, give some words of instruction here. There are so many things that we could talk about connected to baptism. Just have to, each time we do a baptism, just pick a, uh, a few of them. So first, that this is something that has been instituted by Christ. I think it's important that we realize that this is not something that the church invented. Wouldn't this be a neat little ritual to have? It's not like that. In the Great Commission, no, there they're told that a part of what they're supposed to do is, is that they're, he says, go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Very interesting, singular name, but then Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy, Holy Spirit. But then more than that, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, right? So this idea of baptism comes from, uh, from Jesus Christ. It's been instituted for his church. Secondly, that this, this is, is one maybe that would trip up a lot of people, that the, the little ones are counted as holy before baptism. We don't make them holy by putting water on them and saying this word. No, the, the ground for this is from 1 Corinthians seven fourteen which talks about the child of even one believing parent is holy. Hagias, which was the word that they used for inclusion in the covenant community. We know they're not entirely there. They need to profess faith in Christ. And that, that's the third thing that I want to come to. But, but before we get to that, just to say, look, somehow this is not some magic that the church does by saying just the right words, just the right amount of water. No. That's not what it is. We're recognizing something according to God's word that the child of one believing parent is holy. And that has something to do with the connection to Christ. But, but yet we're saying, look, let's not, let's not make this something that the person thinks, well, this is all done and I was baptized and that's all that has to happen in my life. Not so, because there are obligations for all of us, young and old, who would be part of the covenant community of the Lord, right? What are those obligations? Well, things like this, faith, repentance, obedience. And so part of that is this public confession of faith in Christ. So we're looking for Clark, who has wisely chosen to wake up. See, we've, we've, we're, we're looking for him one day to confess faith in Christ, just as Aurelia, Lucia will. And just as Max and Steph and all of us would profess faith in Christ, we don't do that perfectly. There's nothing about our faith and obedience that's perfect. But what we have is the perfect substitute in Jesus Christ, and it's our connection with him that's our only hope, 
All right. So those are just some things. And I, I also just want to uh, encourage all that are present here today, if you're baptized, just to think about these things. Uh, and, and this is a great opportunity for all of us to repent of our sins against our covenant with God. See, we're, we've been marked in, in the covenant, and yet have we actually been true to that? May this stir up your faith, my faith here, and to make a right use of Clark's baptism now for all of us, because again, this is something we do as a community together. So now, also, I just want to encourage Max and Steph in something that, you know, I know they, they do, I, and I encourage them, once again, to teach your children to read the Word of God, uh, to instruct little Clark and the girls in the principles of our holy faith, and the wonder that we have this, you know, recorded for us in some great documents that are designed just for this purpose to help the little ones to actually grow in knowing the truths of the Bible. So we encourage uh, you and all of us in that. And then pray with and for your children. Uh, help them to see prayer as a normal part of the life that we have together. And, and then set a godly example before Clark, before the girls, uh, and, and anybody who might see by every way that God would appoint that, that you would see that, to bring up this child in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And without that last one, well, everything kind of falls apart. So we have to have a sincere uh, faith and obedience ourselves. And all of this from beginning to end has to do with the grace of Almighty God. So we look to him, you know, we look to him in, in every way through all his. Now, I want to read to you just a few verses here that we read every time we baptize. Acts 2.39, Genesis 17.7, and Acts 16.31. So the, the Genesis one is about uh, circumcision, but here you go. For to you is the promise, and to your children, and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call unto him, and now here's the Genesis one. I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. And then back to Acts, believe on the Lord Jesus and thou shalt be saved, thou and thy house. So now I want to ask these questions here to Max and Steph here today. Do you acknowledge your child's need of the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ and the renewing grace of the Holy Spirit? And do you claim God's covenant promises in his behalf? And do you look in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ for his salvation as you do for your own? And do you now unreservedly dedicate your child to God and promise in humble reliance upon divine grace that you will endeavor to set before him a godly example that you will pray with and for him and that you will teach him the doctrines of our holy religion and that you will strive by all the means of God's appointment to bring him up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Yes. And now to the congregation, if you're a communing member of this congregation or if you just wanna stand in support of them, please stand at this point and here's the question I have for you. Do you as a congregation undertake the responsibility of assisting the parents in the Christian nurture of this child? Please be seated. Let's uh, invite the elders forward. I want to pray for a blessing to attend uh, this ordinance and, and then baptize uh, little Clark. So here, you can all somehow make your way. <laughs> Here, find some space. Right. Wonderful. Yeah, that's that's perfect. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we, we, we're so grateful for this opportunity to be together. And we, Lord, we, we recognize that without you, there's, there's nothing here that can happen good in our lives and the lives of our little ones. So we lift all of this up to you and humbly plead for your grace in Jesus' name. Amen.
The child in need, that's like us. The child in need. Yeah. Sometimes we, don't, we just don't know wh which way to turn. Yeah. And unless God could provide, you know, we wouldn't even know exactly what to ask for. But here's an example. This is our little sermon illustration. <laughs> Clark Emrys Randall, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I think you did pretty well, don't you? Yeah, I did. So, elders, you want to pray? Yeah. Father, everything we have is a gift from you. Today we celebrate this most wonderful gift of life. We pray, Father, for your grace and blessing on Clark and on his family as we begin our walk together as disciples of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, we're grateful to you that you give life, that you are the source of all life. We're so grateful for, for little Clark. And Lord, we ask and pray that you would bless him in a mighty way in the days and weeks ahead. Or that he might know you, even at a tender young age. Mm -hmm. He might cry out to you, recognizing his need for you. That we can all trust and rely on the fact that you hear that cry. And that you do indeed answer. Make him, Father, a strong, godly young man. And Lord, that he would praise and honor you all the days of his life. Bless Stephanie and Max as they would look, Lord, to love and care for him and for Lucia and for Aurelia. We ask, Father, that you would grant Max and Stephanie perseverance, patience, and wisdom, and Lord, that hope that never fails as they would rest and trust and hope upon you. We pray, Lord, for Max and Stephanie that you, O oh Lord, would continue to give them the discernment mm -hmm. and the wisdom to best instruct and disciple Clark. Mm -hmm. and we think also of Aurelia and Lucia and the faith that uh, we're praying for them and they will give them grace to be a godly example before the children. We pray for Clark that you would have a tender heart and a conscience mm. and a love for the word of God and that the Clark at the proper time would confess, yes. repent, and believe and have obedience to our Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And to remember his baptism in the times of temptation to give assurance of pardon mm -hmm. and the benefits that are represented in the sealing of the sacrament. Father Martin Luther said that we are all beggars. Mm -hmm. And we come begging today for the soul of his child mm -hmm. that you would bring him to your kingdom, make him an oak of righteousness. Yes, Lord. From a, an early age, he would know you mm -hmm. and the joy of your salvation. Mm -hmm. and Christ be and Father, we, we want to thank you for the big sisters here today. Mm -hmm. And they'll, they'll have such an important role in the life of Clark, of setting an example. And we, we pray that you would bless them from beginning to end in their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace both now and forever. And all God's people said, amen. amen. So now we, we come to the other sacrament that's instituted by Christ, which is the Lord's Supper. And as we come to that today, just want to recognize the, the importance of this doctrine that Dave was teaching on earlier today, that the, we, we see it obviously in the words of institution of baptism, don't we? That baptizing you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, right? So that's obvious, but it's also here in terms of the Lord's Supper, and, and, it, and that's because of the reality of who we're talking about. That's the triune God of the gospel. So the Father sent the Son. Otherwise, we don't have any Lord's Supper. And through the Son and through his atoning death, we receive the blessing of divine justice, 
now satisfied for us through Jesus so that we can be on the right side of justice because of Christ, our substitute. Without that work, no Lord's Supper here today. And then thirdly, through the Holy Spirit, all the benefits that come to us through Jesus are applied to us from the Father through the Son. Sometimes we say through the Father and the Son, the Spirit came, but sometimes by the Spirit that what we have here is every good thing that Christ has actually accomplished for us. You see how this is this is in all about the triune God, and that this is not just, again, some magic bread, no more than it's magic water, magic words that we say. No, it's God, the one God existing eternally in three persons. And so it's that gospel story that we're believing as we partake the bread and partake the cup. And I guess the thing that we just want to remember here is that this is the triune God who blesses us. And, and so it's not a surprise that Paul ends his uh, second letter to the Corinthians, second Corinthians with these words, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. It's a blessing, the Trinitarian blessing. And so if you're uh, a communing member of this church or some other church where you've actually professed faith and repentance and come to believe in the Lord, come to profess that before God and man, been admitted to the table of the Lord, then partake of this bread, partake of this cup. Here today, receive the blessing God has for you in the midst of this. If these things are not true of you, I just urge you to move toward that and actually come into the body of Christ here or, or some other place and, and as a communing part of that body of Christ. So let's ask for the Lord's blessing as we would partake of this food here together today. Father, we, we thank you for each person here with us today. What a great day it is. What a glorious moment now to, to take the bread, to take the cup, to actually be part of this time here together. We pray for grace sufficient for every need now for us in Jesus' name. Amen. in the body of Christ. And the Lord Jesus took bread and he broke it. He gave it to his disciples. He said, take, eat. This is my body.
And Jesus said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Drink of it, all of you. Father, how we thank you for this day. We thank you that we'll be able to spend some time around the tables, if it is your will, Lord, just to time with each other. Especially want to thank you for the Grottens being with us here today. And we pray, Father, earnestly for their ministry in Chile and all the different ways that you're working through every contact that they have. And so we pray for the parents, for the, for the boys, for your grace in their lives, in Jesus' name. Amen. Lead on, O King Eternal. Let's stand now and sing hymn 544. of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit abide with you now and forever and all God's people said amen, amen.